Alrighty. Uh, thank you, Rose uh, and Caitlin and uh, all of Ruby AU and everyone that helped organize this conference. Uh, I know a lot of work goes into conferences like this, and I, and I appreciate uh, having the opportunity uh, and the honor to come here and give you a little talk about taming monoliths without microservices. Uh, just a quick audience participation here. Um, how many folks, show of hands, I won't make you stand up. Uh, how many folks work with Rails in their day job? Okay, just about everyone, okay. Uh, and then anyone doing like Ruby only, out of curiosity? All right, all right, cool, cool. Uh, so this talk is going to apply to both large Ruby code bases or large Rails code bases, um, but it is very much focused on uh, very large Rails code bases, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, just as like a proxy to see like who might be feeling the pains of these rail, large Rails code bases, uh, can everyone raise their hand if they're Rails app starts in a second or more. Okay, leave your hand up if it's five seconds or more. Yeah, 15 seconds or more. 30 seconds or more. 60 seconds or more. Oh my gosh, buy him a beer, please. <laughs> okay. Let's get into it. Uh, so my name is Kelly Sutton. This is the structure of the talk. It's gonna be four pieces. We're gonna go into a little bit about me. I'll breeze through the about me since uh, Caitlin and Rose did a pretty good job there. Um, I'm gonna tell two stories of a team that tries to break down a monolith. Uh, we'll go into a few tactics uh, that you can employ in your day job uh, as to how you might break up a large Rails code base. Uh, and then we're gonna wrap up. So a little bit about me. Um, my name is Kelly Sutton, I'm a software engineer. I live in San Francisco with my fiance, Amelie, and our dog, Greta. Um, I've been in San Francisco for four years. I lived in New York City before that. Uh, if you're a normal human being, you haven't listened to anything I've said in the last sentence or two, and you're just like, who is that dog? <laughs> now usually, Aaron Patterson, aka Tender Love, is here talking about his cats. So uh, I figure it's only appropriate that the states send someone over to talk about uh, their pets at a Ruby conference. So let's talk about Greta for a little bit. Uh, Greta is a very fashionable dog. Uh, she keeps up with the latest hairstyles. Uh, she recently got an ombre hairstyle here. Uh, she's also a very worldly and well-traveled dog. Uh, so here she is wearing a kimono that she recently brought back from Japan. Oops, too far. There we go. That's not why we're here. We are here to talk about Rails projects that push the limits. Uh, so at Gusto, as, as Caitlin mentioned, uh, we move more than one billion USD per month, paying about 1% of the small businesses in the United States. Uh, and we're responsible for 0.1% of the US GDP. Uh, turns out if you work for a company that pays people, people like your product. Um, our code base is about a million and a half lines of code. We have about 80 engineers working on it. And we mostly all work out of the same Rails monolith. And I want to talk a little bit about why payroll is so complicated. Uh, if you've ever worked with tech software or uh, something like that, uh, this is software that combines these very complex topics of time, geography, money, and people. Uh, if you just are dealing, writing software with one of these things, it's going to be pretty complicated. And we make certain trade-offs while building software at Gusto. Uh, we have this phrase, which is correctness is more important than performance. Uh, you can imagine it's okay for your, the act of submitting a payroll or paying your employees to take an extra second, provided that they're being paid the exact right amount. Uh, because when you, do, when you don't do that, uh, the federal government uh, and the state governments get pretty mad. Uh, so a good like, example of where we might make this trade off is deciding on how to cache information. Um, the, the performance of the cache is sometimes going to play into uh, the like, correctness or up-to-dateness of the information there. So we're gonna talk about what goes wrong when things get too big. So in a, in a lot of ways, this is going to be familiar if you've ever read the book Domain-Driven Design. 
uh, or you've seen a lot of folks talk about very large applications. And in some ways, this, this is the same talk that you might have heard 20 or 30 years ago. What we're really talking about is just modular modularizing an application as we go. Uh, and I think it's great that Rails is old enough now where Rails ha is legacy software in some companies. That's cool, that's good. Like there are companies that have legacy software and then there are companies that are dead. So let's give ourselves a, ra a round of applause. Uh, so I wanna talk about breaking down a monolith. And, and, and to do this, I first need to talk about like the swamp, or you might call it the ball of mud. Uh, this is the application that is huge, that takes 60 seconds to start up, uh, and it seems like you almost can't even make a change in it without something else breaking. This is what our swamp looks like. Um, each of the nodes here is a Rails model file. We have over 700 models in the application right now. Each individual color is a different team, right? Uh, this is after we've been working on this for a year. Uh, we still have several years to go here. Um, in a perfect world, you would see the colors clustered a little bit closer together and less of these like god objects. Like you can see that god object right in the center. Uh, that is app slash models slash company dot rb. Um, grab me after and buy me a beer and I'll tell you about it. Um, uh, and, and really like the, the monolith or like the, the coupling and like the swampiness and the ball of mud in a monolith really starts with the models. Uh, you can't decouple an application if you don't focus on the models first. Uh, working on an application like this uh, can feel like you have your head stuck in a Kleenex box. <laughs> she was fine, don't worry. <laughs> no animals were harmed in the making of this presentation. Uh, so this is what our swamp mostly looks like. Uh, we have you know, this big amorphous application uh, we fulfill several benefits for our customers, including payroll, HR uh, benefits, health insurance, uh, and some infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, you'll be working on this and maybe someone new comes along or, or someone gets fed up and they say, hey, let's extract a service. To that you say, cool. <laughs> so you get together with your team and you're like, okay, let's, let's figure out what to carve out of our application here. Um, in our example, we're gonna decide, you know, this HR thing, let's extract that out. So this is like names and addresses uh, and personal identification numbers. Um, and some of the information might be shared between these two, but they're still distinct concepts, right? So we start off and we say, great, Rails new. Boom, HRV2, here we go. And then we enumerate all of the things that HR1 V1 does today. Let's say it's like 14 things. And then we slowly start connecting it back uh, to the main application, uh, meticulously going one by one and moving those 14 behaviors over. Uh, but usually about like halfway through, it becomes someone's full-time job just to say, okay, what's in HRV2 and what's in HRV1? <laughs> Go a little bit further. Uh, and you're still getting bug reports against the old HR system. So now you have this like weird thing where you're like, okay, so I guess we fixed the bug in the old HR system, but we need to recreate it in the new one and then fix it there. Uh, and uh, your product manager is breathing down your neck and eventually you're like, okay, uh, we're 13 out of 14. Like this last 14th one turns out it was a lot more complicated than anyone knew how. The person who wrote it left. Uh, so this project is done. So you call it quits. <laughs> But now, you know, we like all, we all uh, celebrate. Um, but now actually, even though like given like our best intentions, I think to, to Laura's talk, right? We've actually created a problem that is worse. Uh, we have like literally created tribal knowledge in our system. Now, whenever we wanna go find an HR concept, we have to go ask someone, hey, is that, is that in HRV2 or is that in the old HR appendage that is just kind of sticking around, right? And this old HR thing is important because if it wasn't, we would just delete it. So I'm here to say that there is a better way of doing things like this. Uh, and hopefully you're like, tell me more. <laughs> uh, so I wanna take a different view on this problem or a different view on the swamp. Uh, and we're still gonna use this example of HR and payroll, right? And we're gonna use the, the specific example of an employee active record moving between these domains. The vertical bars here uh, can be any layer of code. It can be a controller, it can be service classes, it can be uh, presenters, it can be mailers, it can be views, right? The important thing is, is that this employee active record, which is mostly owned by HR, 
uh, moves all the way over to payroll to fulfill some need. Let's say it's putting a last name on a pay stub, right? So we pass that all the way down uh, through, through the stack. Uh, and then it, this says employee.lastName, right? Seems in innocuous enough. And in fact, it is. In a small application, this is exactly what you should do. When you have 100 engineers with 700 plus models, you need to like, think and ask them like, really silly questions. Right? So in this example, what happens uh, if someone gets married and changes their last name? What if someone transitions and changes their first name? Do you want an application whose poor design dead names people all over the planet? Probably not. And that's, that's kind of like hard to, hard to describe too, which is like, hey, we messed up, uh, uh, we messed up uh, your pay stub because our software design sucks. It's not an acceptable excuse, I would say. Uh, and furthermore, because uh, software like this often deals with governments, right, uh, the different government agencies are going to have different ideas of what your last name should be when, or what your first name should be when, uh, and they will say, uh, we don't respect that information if you tell them the wrong thing, right? So now you're in this situation where you might need to add a date parameter to getting someone's last name. That's like literally my job, just adding date parameters to every method call. <laughs> So we're going to introduce a conceptual boundary between HR and payroll here, uh, indicated by the nice keynote animation and this yellow bar. Uh, and this is going to be our translation layer. It's where we're going to take this employee active record object and we're going to turn it into something else. Uh, we're going to turn it into a green value object. It's not actually going to be green, but it is not going to be active record. It's just going to be a bundle of values. Right? So these are strings, these are numbers, but it's very clear where does active record stop and where do values begin? And then this goes all the way down to the view or, or the email uh, in which we're sending. And then this finally says payroll employee.lastname. Now, if you're sitting in the audience, you're probably like, well, you just moved some code around. You're right, I did. <laughs> uh, but why would we want to do this? Again, it's for those very specific uh, uh, insights where like the concept of an employee for uh, for HR is very different from a concept for an employee for payroll, right? And this is where the complexity in the system comes from. Uh, for payroll, it's not much more than metadata or just a label or something that you print at the top of your paycheck. For HR, it's much more about the entity of like, who are you and who are you and how do you change over time? And as we iterate on this a little bit, we'll continue to kind of better define, okay, what is the HR system responsible for? What is payroll responsible for? And more specifically, how do we communicate with payroll? Right? And we're doing this all in process. Uh, no JSON, no network calls, still just within the monolith. And so you see this very weird, uh, uh, yeah, a weird situation arise where you have active record objects, you serialize them or turn them into plain old Ruby objects, these value objects, and then they might actually become active record objects again on the payroll side. Uh, but that's actually built a lot of structure into our application because it says here is how uh, anyone can communicate with the payroll system. Here's what they need to provide. If we ever decide to move them into separate services, changing these green value objects from POROs, plain old Ruby objects, into JSON or gRPC or Thrift or Avro or whatever is gonna be popular next week, that's like a one week task, right? The monolith is already broken apart, it's just all in the same repo. At the 2018 RailsConf, uh, DHH uh, talked about this concept of conceptual compression. One of the great things about Rails is that things like active records smoosh together so many concepts and allow us to be so effective at our jobs. Uh, still today, when choosing to like, build a little side project, I always choose Rails first uh, because it is so great at getting something off the ground. Uh, but as you see success and as these projects grow, you need to start to peel apart some of those layers and you say like, okay, those four or five things that Active Record is doing for me, uh, what do I need to start to expand, right? So that's where we get into like the, the specific tactics of what does that look like for us? Um, and again, I wanna like disclaimer this so hard, do not go into work on Monday and say, hey, I heard this at a conference, we're gonna do all this stuff, <laughs> right? Have a conversation with your team, see if it's the right thing to do. 
Okay, so we're gonna do four tactics. Uh, first one, mind and avoid circular dependencies. So circular dependencies make it very hard to change uh, code. Um, and it's very hard in a Rails application because it is the default, okay? Uh, you're often always writing code like this. The company has many employees. Employee belongs to uh, a company. Uh, but more and more, we've started to actually question, do we need this relationship in the other direction? Because every time we draw this relationship, uh, it becomes that much harder to unwind it later. If we draw a dependency graph, right, it's gonna look like this. And instead, we often want our dependency graphs to look like this. Eliminate the cycles. Recommendation number two, uh, use value objects to traverse the edges of the different parts of your application. Uh, these are the plain old Ruby objects. Let's look at an example of how this might look. We have a service class or a service object that handles what should happen when a company signs up in our application. We're gonna send an email and increment some stats counter, right? Uh, and this looks innocuous enough. Again, small application, do this. Don't just like delete this uh, from your bookmarks. Delete this talk from your bookmarks. Uh, but what, we're actually, what we've actually done is we've, we've forever coupled our company mailer and our stats tracker to the structure of our company model. Uh, this is probably not that big of a deal, uh, but as our application grows, um, it can be very, very difficult to untangle. So instead, we just peel just the values that we need uh, off of those uh, rich active record objects, turn them into values, maybe give those bundles of values names like we did in a previous example, and then just pass those along uh, to, what it, to whatever uh, subsequent class uh, or method uh, that they need to do their job, right? So here, the company mailer actually only needs an email address and a first name, right? Recommendation number three, avoid callbacks. Um, again, this is not obvious, and if you read the Rails docs, uh, no one is going to say, hey, here's this nice thing that you should not use at all. You can use it, just be very, very careful. So another example here. Uh, here we have a company uh, that is gonna send, uh, send an email uh, when a company is created, right? Uh, this is like the type of code uh, that is always going to bite us as, as soon as like the sales team asks us a question, which is, hey, we're gonna import a bunch of companies, but don't email them, please. Huh, how, do we, how do we do that? And now you're like Googling like how to turn off Rails callbacks, and you're like, how did I get here? What am I doing? And the reason is, is because we, again, we have this like cycle where the, the company knows a lot about the company mailer, the company mailer knows exactly how the, the, the company is structured, right? So instead, we want to think about this dependency graph and we want to change it in a way, uh, where we want to introduce a, a service object that, that just sees over the two uh, responsibilities, the responsibility of creating a company, the responsibility of sending an email, right? This looks like overkill for a simple thing, but when the process of creating a company uh, grows to be 14 different actions, each of which are important to the business, and you have 14 different teams asking you, hey, can you like turn that off for this one special use case? This is a lot easier to re reason about than many, many callbacks. So this is the dependency graph uh, that we want to draw here. A general rule of thumb with large applications as they grow is that it is better to have more nodes in your implicit dependency graph that you draw uh, with simpler relationships, fewer cycles, than to have fewer nodes with cycles in them. So we will gladly introduce a new node to our dependency graph, which is gonna feel like overkill for many of you, uh, if it keeps the structure of this application simple, if it, if it kind of keeps that directed acyclic graph acyclic. Final recommendation, move slowly. Uh, any of these things might take dozens, hundreds of PRs to eventually land. Uh, to your product teams, you're gonna have to like s sit down with them and say like, okay, we're gonna do this, and then things are going to get faster over time, uh, but for now, nothing is going to change. We're just gonna refactor, right? Um, you need to make a strong business case for how this is going to help you speed up and help you develop safer software. No matter how bad the current code is today, you have to stick with it. Uh, you cannot start from scratch. Unfortunately, Rails new is not going to save you. And you need to move slowly and move incrementally. 
So I want to leave you with one thought. Uh, this is a thought from uh, someone I looked up, look up to quite a bit. Uh, his name is Kent Beck. He, uh, you might know him from extreme programming or uh, the agile software movement. Uh, but he has this phrase which is, make the hard change easy, this may be hard, then make the easy change. So when we talk about breaking apart a monolith or extracting microservices, the hardest thing is usually injecting structure into an unstructured application. Uh, Rails newing up something actually ends up being the last uh, thing that we write, not the first. Uh, extracting a microservice is very, very easy if you have these boundaries drawn. Um, when doing these projects, you're going to need to set a vision with your team, uh, and you're going to need to really trust each other. Uh, but it can be done. We're still working on it. Maybe I'll have more to share next year. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Kelly. And maybe if you're back next year, you could bring Greta. I think she was a great addition to the slides. Um, and